are you ready for some gorilla geology? I hadn't planned to make the stop at all. Uh, I'm outside of Moab on the road into Castle Valley. It's just 17 miles that way. And I stopped for a lunch break and I noticed this outcrop behind me that I never spent any time looking at. I thought, there's no time like the present. Bust it. I got my camera, so you're gonna come with me. I think it's the fluvial upper Triassic Chin Lee Formation. That's the latest Triassic unit before the Wingate sandstone. So I thought we'd go take a look at the Triassic, see if it is indeed fluvial. Looks like it from here. Let's see what the rocks have to tell us. Never pass up an opportunity to look at rocks. And as usual, it's always a good policy to take a moment, set the context, and talk a little bit about where and when we are in the world. In this case, we're on the western side of the supercontinent Pangaea that existed from the Paleozoic right through to the early Jurassic, and we're in the late Triassic period. So we're at about 230 to 220 million years ago. And at this time, a series of mountain uplifts were really starting to shed a lot of sediment into the evolving western interior basin. So we've gone from a time of shallow seas and lacustrine and sabka environments to one dominated by river systems. These rivers were carrying sediment and water being shed off of surrounding highlands like the Uncompagre uplift, which was starting to shed a lot of sediment into the Paradox Basin. The massive weight of all that sediment being dumped into the basin began to push down on a Paleozoic salt deposit called the Paradox Formation, which is thousands of feet thick. Salt behaves in a really unusual way when it's been buried and pressure is applied in that it starts to behave like a very viscous fluid. So that salt layer started to displace upward and bulge up at the surface, and that created a series of salt walls, salt domes, salt diapirs, and all of that affected the fluvial systems by creating topography that they either flowed around or had to cut through. All right, now that the global and conceptual context is out of the way, let's take a moment and kind of get our bearings in the outcrop before we run across and start sticking our nose right up against it. We're going to be approaching it from these two red starred areas because they're the easiest access. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, we have the Jurassic Wingate sandstone at the top of the outcrop, and we're going to be focusing on the Chinle formation below. If you've watched my other videos on fluvial outcrops or you've done this before, you know the first step is to mark out obvious straddle bounding surfaces that denote channel bodies, like these. In this panel, I've made the bounding surfaces red, and the white lines indicate laminations in the floodplain while the blue is the marker between the two formations. And now finally it's time to look at rocks armed with all this information. The first thing we'll do is take a look at these talus blocks because that's always good for a laugh. Let gravity do the work for you so you don't have to go scrambling up. Now these sandstone chunks came from the ledge above my head so we know they're from that channel shaped body but look at this. Some little hollows filled in with siltstone and mudstone clasts. That's pretty typical of bank collapse into a river channel where the overbank tumbles in and forms rounded clasts. There's also this, this coarse grained sand. It's not really gravel, it's just a very coarse grained sand suggesting you know, fairly high energy flows. Uh, there's ripples, you can see those nice ripple crests suggesting shallow water. And again, more of these partially hollowed out uh, cavities that contain remnants of the siltstone and mudstone which are rounded, so they've been transported a little bit. All right, we've been looking at, you know, bedding surfaces, but take a look at this really nice cross-section. We can see some interesting bedding throughout here in cross-sectional view. You can see some of those coarser grain little deposits interspersed with finer grain. You can see nice parting lineations. Uh, that's where two beds come together, and there might be a little finer grain um, unit separating them. Look at this. Here's some little forsets, some little ripples, um, you know, in cross-sectional view, but take a look at these interesting features, these different colors. That's not primary sedimentary structures. That's not original bedding. That's actually secondary accumulation of mineral deposits um, creating this appearance of original bedding, but it's really a diagenetic effect. And that's important to keep in mind when you're looking at sedimentary rocks because not everything you see is original bedding. So we're not gonna make that mistake as we continue on looking at this outcrop. So these rocks with these little ripped up chunks of clay and silt all came from this body up here. You can see that ledge. And that ledge is actually the base of a channel body scour. You can see the heterolithic silt and muds and clays below. 
And by heterolithic, all I mean is it's a combination of uh, different lithologies, in this case, mud, sand, and silt. That's pretty typical in an overbank deposit, in other words, something not deposited in a channel. Then there's the scour with the sandstone, which is typical of something deposited in a channel. And there's even some interesting little maybe trace fossils. So now it's time for a closer look. So here's that basal material, that white colored, and it does have pebbles in it. It's got like rip up plasts, um, little gravels, pebbles, and things. And then fine grained, pretty well laminated. That looks like it was deposited spake recently. Look at this fracture. The fracture has that chlorite all around it, and that's reduction. So that's good evidence that it was something, some kind of fluid flow here, different from the surrounding red bed that got oxidized. Could have been a root, could have been um, a burrow network, or just some sort of weird pattern um, associated with a fracture. But those are the things that have captured my attention. These guys. What is going on with them? This definitely looks like a burrow cast of some kind. This I'm not so sure about. And this I'm not sure about. Maybe they're not. Maybe they're just odd loads. Load casts happen when sediment gets pushed down. Like this is a groove cast. I'm um, gonna get load casts, groove casts. This one is really suspicious though. It kind of does look like a burrow. Okay, these little features have me stumped. They could be the remnants of crawfish or crayfish burrow casts, uh, and those are really common in the Chinle Formation. Or they could simply represent load casts when a dense sediment settles into a softer sediment and creates these little pillowy structures as it pushes down. This is typically where you would find footprints if there's any in here. There's some grooves like that, like that. I'll show you something got scraped along. It's really common for trees to get dumped into rivers during floods and their branches and roots kind of drag along the bottom, creating these big long linear grooves that then get filled in with sediment. If there's a log or something during the flood that deposited this river, there's some more in there. Ugh, spider web too. Yeah, lots of, look at that, ridges, grooves, again, where things got dragged along in the mud, left behind drag marks, and then the sand filled it in after it got deposited. Okay, and the sand is pretty well laminated before we get up into that heterolithic. Now, I'm not going to go climbing around on it, because it's right by the road, but you get the idea. And now it's time for a thought experiment. If we had drilled a core and pulled out a three inch section through this rock, we would have been able to describe the vertical succession that we just walked through. And we could have come up with a depositional model of, you know, a fine to medium grain fluvial sandstone body. Likewise, a wireline log would have given us the same interpretation. And if we had just stopped and looked at this single outcrop, we would have been pretty happy. But it's always absolutely essential to look left, right, and as far as you can up and down an outcrop before making an interpretation. Because after all, the world's a three-dimensional place, and you don't want to use a one- or two-dimensional data set. With that in mind, let's take a walk about a car length or two to the west and see how much variability there is in the outcrop. And we're going to walk across safely again. Holy cow, that is some coarse, coarse grain stuff. There's cobbles in here. That is from a local uplift. This probably didn't travel too far. By local, I mean within, you know... 100 miles, couple hundred miles. We're not talking something that's coming from thousands of miles away. Here's more rip-up clasts. Pretty clean sand. This is from the main channel body. You can see it's cross-bedded again. It's got leasing gang beds. So leasing gang bedding is fooling us into thinking it's cross-bedding, but it's not. Wow, yeah, look at that. Very, very coarse grain conglomerate. So we've got conglomerate. We've got pretty fine-grained sandstone, siltstone. Yeah, there's where the conglomerate's coming from, right up there. So we've got conglomerate beds at the base of the channel, right where they should be. Scoured surface. 
Now, if you've watched my other videos or if you know anything at all about sedimentology and stratigraphy, you know that the shapes of these sedimentary bodies can tell us a lot about how they formed and where they formed. And this cleaner oranger sandstone has all the characteristics of a bar building laterally into a channel, while the heterolithic material has features typical of an abandoned channel fill. You can actually see the channel-shaped scour that's filled in with the heterolithics in this outcrop, and you might be thinking to yourself, now wait a second, Anton, you told me heterolithics are typical of overbanks. True, but the same process that fills up an abandoned channel fill is what's creating the overbank deposits, specifically episodic floods dumping in coarse and fine-grained sediment. And that means we've got the full channel belt succession, which consists of not just the bars that we're accumulating in the channel, but also the oxbow deposits or slough deposits represented by those heterolithics. Here's some more blocks. I really kind of was hoping there'd be some footprints or something on the blocks. Doesn't seem to be. Just that clean sand. It makes sense if they were deposited very quickly. If that sand just kind of came in in one big goosh. The climate during the late Triassic, when these Chinle formation rocks were accumulating, was fairly monsoonal to even semi-arid, and rivers in those circumstances really commonly have big outpourings of sediment in a very short amount of time, which leads to these big massive dumps of sand. And there's also a noticeable lack of organic material, in other words there's no coal, no carbonaceous shale, it's mostly silt and some clay in the overbank, which again is consistent with these kind of semi-arid to monsoonal climate environments. All right, so I think we've seen enough up close. We've been able to take a look from afar. We can start putting together our final story for this outcrop. First off, there's three separate channel bodies, at least, that we can recognize here. There's the underlying floodplain overbank material and the overlying Jurassic wind gate, and between them are these three bodies. Of those three bodies, we can only really get to the lower two because the third one is too high to climb, but it looks a lot like the second one. So we have a lower sand-dominated body, which is number one, and then two heterolithic bodies on top. In the lowermost body, there's that really coarse conglomeratic section that represents the basal part of the channel called the Tallweg. And overlying that is a series of low-angle accretionary sets within the sand-dominated and the heterolithic bodies, which represent accretion of bars. Okay, so I think even in this short amount of time we spent looking at the rocks and just looking at a few key features, once again, we'd be able to make some observations use analogs and interpret what these rocks are. Sure enough, they've got the channel form shape, they've got scours, they've got coarse grain, conglomerate and rip-up class at the base, where the highest energy is in a fluvial channel. There's cross-bedding and ripples, indicating unidirectional flow in the channel. And there's even abandoned channel fills uh, in the form of silt and heterolithics, either abandoned channels or kind of low energy bars before the channel gets re-incised by the next channel in time. So, made a few good observations made some good interpretations based on the analog. Didn't take that long, you saw, just a few minutes. If we had some photo mosaics, drone photos, whatever, we could do some detailed interpretation, get some measurements, uh, and quantify this. But for now, I think we've done a pretty decent job of characterizing the outcrop in just a few minutes. You never know what you can do when you're out looking at rocks. You never know what you're gonna find. On that note, as always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time on The Outcrop.